Welcome to the Communication Diva Podcast, Episode 7. Today's podcast is a feature interview with North American Native practitioner and spiritual helper Amelia McCumber from the Ojibwe Nation. One of Millie's teachings is that communication between people first happens through the meeting of spirits, not through words or gestures, but through intuition. One of the many quotes attributed to Albert Einstein is that the only really valuable thing is intuition. Last week in the capital city of Canada, representatives of the Conservative government met with First Nations chiefs from across Canada to discuss resolving the terrible conditions in which many First Nations people still live, particularly those living on remote reserves. Prime Minister Stephen Harper had to leave the seven-hour meeting early in order to fly to Switzerland for the annual economic summit in Davos. So the PM couldn't even fit seven hours into his schedule for an enormous human rights issue that has plagued Canada for over a hundred years. I wonder what Millie and Albert would intuit from that. Welcome to Communication Diva. This is Jen Swanson, and this is the podcast that helps explore all areas of communication in the hopes that you will find something new and something that will help to deepen your own relationships. And I'm excited today because my featured guest is Amelia McComber, known as Millie, and she is a North American Native practitioner and spiritual helper. And I would like to welcome Millie today. Thanks, Jen. Um... My discussion today is about our specific worldview um, from uh, an Ojibwe lens. And the Ojibwe people are located in the middle part of um, North America. We call it Turtle Island, most of our people. And um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about our means of communication in, in a lot of our communities. Um, we come from uh, a notion that everything that we experience uh, has a direct relation to our connection to the Creator. So I have to start off this story about, you know, all of the gifts that, that our creation story tells, tells us about. So in the beginning of our creation story, there was an understanding that man was separated, and I mean man and woman. Uh, the color of man, white, yellow, brown, and red, uh, were all separated. And in our creation story, the white man was to the north, and he was given the gift of movement. That meant he, he meant he was able to move. The yellow man was given the gift of relationship and this relationship was about the relationship that one kept with history as well as the future and it informed the now the brown man the black man in the south was given the heart of all humanity and they are very passionate people and have moved throughout history in such a way that would dictate that they do indeed carry the heart the red man was given the gift of vision and this vision that I speak of is not a vision with my eyes. It's a vision with my, my spirit, my totality of my being. And so when I speak like that, I'm talking about, you know, intuition, sensitivity, um, not second guessing our first intuition. Because we're a, a total being, we have to collect all our information and then make a decision. So, um, the way I want to approach this is through this notion of this gift. And so in the creation story, each, each man separated and went away from the creator, each maintaining their, their gift. And the idea is that the creator said that we can't come together until we each bring these gifts to the table and we'll work in a cooperation cooperatively to find balance and harmony with one another and thus bring and restore balance and harmony to the earth. And so the red man 
left and began to feel and sense that he had this longing to be close to the Creator again. And he returned back to the Creator and he he said, you know, I, as I leave, I, I begin to feel this disconnect from you. And the Creator informed him that that The creator is in all things, and he is the creator of everything. And so if we look with our gift of vision, we will be able to see the depth. So as the red man began to travel west, um, he had to walk softly and be careful about where he was stepping because he began to see, indeed, the creator in all things. Um, through the leaf, the blade of grass, the tree. And so today in current societies, um, there's a lot of mis- mis- con- preconceived notions about um, our people, my people. And uh, it has a lot to do with this notion of how we move in the world. Um, there have been terms such as Indian time and, you know, but it, it all relates back to that gift and how we move in the world. And so what am I talking about? I'm talking about, you know, in conventional society, they talk about intuition as being somewhat out there and not reality. Um, but in my worldview, it is very much a reality. It is, uh, it is what substantiates that which we see with our eyes. And, um, so what I'm referring to is in conventional thought, it is known that maybe we have a sphere around us that is our personal sacred space. And, and generally they suggest that it's, you know, our arm's length apart, that that would be our sacred space and, you know, that would be our sphere of understanding. In our understanding from an uh, Ojibwe worldview, um, our spirit is not only conducted with that kind of energy, it also has other aspects to the vision that are uh, incorporated in our worldview. And one of these is, you know, the dreaming spirit. The dreaming spirit is a part of our dream world uh, that would suggest in Western culture that it wasn't real. But I'm sure there's been a time that you've dreamt and you've awakened and you felt, uh, you know, very tired from your sleep because you felt like, you know, you had this wild dream and you traveled all over the world and, you know, all in a matter of a few hours. And in our understanding, you did leave. There was a portion of you left, your spirit, that left to travel and to see and to go and do. And so when you came back to your body, you were tired. Your spirit was tired because you had indeed traveled through that dream and your spiritual dream. Now, there's also this notion in our worldview that um, our spirit doesn't end at our fingertips, that our spirit really, in actual fact, is a sphere that goes around us by about eight feet in circumference. So we're talking 16 feet from back to front. And so this way, um, part of this vision is that when we meet someone, um, our spirits meet first. So Ideally, we would be about 16 to 20 feet away, depending on how much spiritual energy and how much of the gift you carry. And so we would see, we would meet each other spiritually first. Our spirits would discern about one another, and then we would acknowledge one another as a part of the same family, the same systems, or whatever. So... What I'm talking about here is I'm talking specifically about a totally uh, non-Western ideology, uh, a new way to examine our sacred space and understand that communication is held in many different ways and in many different worldviews. So, for example, um, in my understanding, how this is supported is that, you know, We know that when an infant child, probably under the age of probably six months, 
they can begin to examine their world. But the notion is, is that because they are born and they are new to this world, it is a new experience. When in fact, in our ideology, that spirit, that child of that spirit is still connected to the other world, the spiritual world, the dimension where the creator sends that child into life and, and blesses it with its family. And so the notion is, is that this, this spirit, the spirit of this little child is very much aware of the spiritual essence of the energies around them. So sometimes a spirit, uh, a child will identify or um, look at an individual that they're attracted to and will be mesmerized from a distance by this spiritual essence. Um, another way to confirm this is um, largely with an animal. Animals tend to, uh, won't come to uh, to a spiritual being who is not um, held itself in regard to that knowledge of the spiritual essence, and uh, so these two these two uh, aspects of our Western current society are also like little little indicators. Um, another indication would be, um, for example, intuition. So much. In the Western world, we hear, oh, that's not real, you know. But more and more, as we bridge the 21st century, we're beginning to rethink our, our theories about knowledge. And so when I say that um, that we begin to rethink, we're, we're beginning to understand that our intuition and our gifts are not all that far off. It's kind of like that gut instinct, that first gut instinct when you meet someone and maybe they don't sit that right with you, but they look okay and they hold all the pieces in all the right places and they have all the documents. And so you go against that intuition and that first impression, they call it. Well, that first impression is really that circumference of our circles having met our spiritual essence. And you see, we carry that spiritual essence in all our domains. And so when I say, um, I recently had a colleague of mine um, who was uh, uh, practicing, uh, he was going on a mission. He was a, a fill-in minister and he was going into native territory and, and he asked me, he said, um, he said, is there anything I should know? And I, and I was, I said, okay. I said, I'm going to tell you. I said, um, was, was, was this person a First Nations person? No, um, no, this person was a Western Canadian, a Canadian, um, born and bred and, uh, very, very, uh, distinguished gentleman. But he, he recognized his, his limitations when it came to dealing with, my people. And so he just asked me, he said, is there anything I should know? And I, and I said to him, I said, yeah, there's one thing you might want to know. And he said, what's that? And I said, my people or the people where I come from tend to feel and experience at a, at a, at a spiritual level that is not necessarily practiced and, and understood by Westerners. And, and he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I said, for example, I said, if you have any, you know, preconceived notions or intentions, I said, that will be shown through your spiritual essence. So that's true spirit that travels around you at eight, eight feet circumference, um, is also meeting their spirit at an eight feet circumference. So they can sense and feel the difference. And so when um, a, some people approach Native people to assist them in any way, um, they can sense their preconceived notions and judgments. And it's only because of this spiritual awareness through the gift of vision that, that we understand that this is a part of the their world and our world. And the two are not, are not meeting until now. So... What, what 
is the indication that the two are meeting now? What is the indication would be is that um, one, you are a Westerner and um, clearly open to this uh, possibility of communication. Um, what I'm talking about is is a communication that is that is a gift from God that we have limited in our Western framework of learning and teaching, and we have opted out of in terms of knowledge. And we've left it to one part of, of training, which is theological training and, and, uh, and that sort. Um, but with the bridge of the new age and the coming of, of uh, new ideas, um, this opportunity is out there. And um, all we need to do is ask and be asked and um, share, our, share our interpretation of this. Yeah, and that, and and I think that is done well through storytelling and through through just meeting, you know, one another in various places as well. As far as the communication, what 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 can you talk about uh, with regards to um, helping people to be more in tune with this meeting of the spirits? I I think. I think it really ties into, and I, and I identify with, you know, allowing people to start where they're at and, and reaffirming who they are. So I self-identify by, as a native practitioner and a spiritual helper, but I really don't do it by myself. Um, my community has given me that privilege to do this work in the communities. And, and so what do I do? I go and I sit with people who want to sit with me. And I can't sell this gift. This gift is not for sale. Never been, <laughs> never will be. Um, but I can trade it and barter it. Um, and so the way it works is that I share my gift with the individual who comes to ask me for support, and, and I don't know this person, and they don't know me, so it's a really a trusting and open relationship. But if we go back to what I've said, then our spirits have already been acquainted and already meet. And most uh, most times, it's my, my helpee or the person who's coming to receive support that is called to me. They sit there and they toy with themselves because, you know, they wonder if they should or if they wonder if they shouldn't. And and when they find out that I'm not selling it for, uh, you know, X amount of dollars, uh, they're more open because I'm not there to sell it to them or I'm there to assist, um, share my gift, but bring that gift to its rightful place, which is really about the creator wanting to unify and help them on their journey so that they might be able to see um, where they've gone off their path or how they have forgotten perhaps some important things that were formative in their early years. That is a part of our social conditioning. And our social conditioning unfortunately, has a big play in, in who we think we are and who we want people to see. It isn't necessarily who we are, though, um, because we're conditioned out of it. We're conditioned out of our sensitivities because the rational world says it's unreal. And, um, but we're now at a bridging a, an important stage in, in humanity where there's more openness and uh, more availability at diverging ideas. You mentioned um, um, intuition, and I just wonder if there is more openness to, to relying on intuition, because we have been so versed in uh, you know, education and knowledge and putting thing in t things into little boxes for years and years, that I wonder if um, you see a movement towards more trusting of that intuition that we have. Like anything, it happens when we trust, okay? But trust doesn't come just because I will it. So education is important. 
you know, uh, we can't move in this world without having the signposts in front of us that we can acknowledge and, and respect. Um, but in, at the same time, we can't forget who we are. And, and so when I talk about tuition and, and how tuition evolves, it evolves through, you know, let's go back to the baby. So the baby, when he's born, he knows who he is. According to our mythology, the Creator had a talk with the spirit, and this spirit of this child chose its family, chose it knowing the circumstances that would come and befall it through its journey. But it was given a sacred mission, you see, and the sacred mission was for the community. You see, this gift that I have is only mine if I share it. It will be taken from me if I don't. If I try and gain some sort of advancement for self, um, some kind of grandiose notion that I'm the greatest, when in fact I'm human just like anyone else, a spiritual being having a human experience. And so, as I said, uh, this young child comes into life and it comes in in the early stages of, of its infancy, remembering that vision, that talk with the Creator, and knowing and identifying with that sensitivity realm. So then, then intuition is there already when a, when a baby is born. But do we learn, do we, do we learn to ignore it? <clears throat> yes, I think we do. And primarily because um, part of our Western structures of education um, dictate that it is that is not appropriate. Um, a lot of the social conditioning around children has been, you know, you can be seen but not heard. Um, in our culture, it's very different. Um, corporal punishment was not a part of our worldview. Uh, the community was very much uh, raising the child in a healthy, uh, functioning community. Um, the aunties would be everyone in the community. The uncles would be everyone in the community. And, and the elders, the grandmothers and grandfathers, they would be the child minders primarily. And they would uh, be able to identify and lead this child but not lead it in a way in which they wanted it to grow. They would lead it in the way in which it was going. So, for example, if a child was crawling towards a, a, an electrical outlet with a fork, the elder <laughs> might step in front of it and take away the fork and, you know, maybe provide security measures over the, over the outlet. Um, and traditionally, uh, I mean, it was our environment that dictated our worldview. So uh, a lot of times I like to use like, um, you know, uh, little cubs or little, little wolves. You know, the mother will allow these wolves to play with one another and, and get stronger as they, as they grow and experience. But the mother will inter intervene if, danger is in, in play, and she will be able to pull that, that little cub or little wolf cub out of the way. And so that's, that's pretty much what our elders do. And, and the notion is, is that that spirit, that spirit of that child continues to walk knowing exactly where it was going. And so our people don't interfere with a child, they just accommodate and help support wherever that child is to be used because it is to be used for the betterment of the whole community. That's, that's a beautiful notion. And, and I think we lose things when we become so individualized and individualistic. And I, I noticed that, well, I mean, it's been going on for a while, but I've noticed that a lot of people don't know their neighbors and don't know who lives next door and don't know, you know, the person three doors down and all the rest of it. And there is that loss of sense of community in a lot of places here in North America. Yeah, I think a major contributor to that is uh, the automobile. 
The automobile has um, enabled people to not develop in a community. They can go out and choose their community at random. Um, another another means uh, for the loss of community is that um, we we have been conditioned so far away from our true identity and our true notion through our schooling and education and through our corporal punishment. Every time you hit a child, you disrupt its pattern. Any time you discipline a child in the means of a loud voice, you harm the child's direction. Because violence, as we know, comes in many forms. And so um, if a child is empowered, um, allowed to experience life in a non-threatening way, <clears throat> that child will evolve into the being that it is meant to be. And sure, th they're going to have challenges, but if you have an open, um, open relationship where you, like for example, my grandson, he could, I could never um, hug him face to face. And so when he was very young, below the age of three, I would get on my knees and hug him. And then when he started to get a little bit older, I would put him on a chair and, and I would hug him. And today, you know, he's, um, he's five foot eight and I'm five foot three. And I joke with him and I say, one day, Nan will be on the chair <laughs> hugging my boy. So, you know, it, it's all about nurturing the child and allowing him to make decisions so that he can really feel out his direction. What is calling to him? What is his passion? I ask him many times. Where is joy in your life? And if that's where joy, where you bring happiness, because joy is about community. It is not about the individual. When joy becomes an individual act, it becomes a little maybe perhaps narcissistic because then the individual wants to experience it again and again and again. But true joy is a joy to be experienced within the group and in relationship with others. Yeah, and that's, that's why I think communication is just key to so many aspects of, of humanity is to, uh, to be able to deepen those relationships and the communities that support those relationships too. If you have uh, some word of advice for people who are listening, what would that be? Well, this is a tough one for you uh, intellectuals and <laughs> because I'm going to suggest that the next time you have a hunch, the next time you have an intuition, I'm going to suggest that you follow it and that and that let it follow through and you will be amazed at what happens next. Um, because when we start to allow the notion of our intuitive abilities and our spiritual gifts to come to light, the blessings will continue to come and doorways will begin to open. For example, my grandson, he's, he's an avid wrestler and he really enjoys wrestling. And he said, you know, uh, just the other day, he said, you know, Nan, I would really like to explore wrestling. And in our culture, the power of our words, and especially when we're in community, in communion with someone else, when we, when we talk about this kind of notion, um, it manifests because the universe and the powers are listening. And so the very next day or that day, I said to him, I said, sure, of course, I'll support you in anything you want to do. I said, all we need to do is get you into a high school with a good program and you can go and follow that aspect of it. And um, the very next day, I said, you know, it's an Olympic sport too, eh, wrestling? And he said, oh. And so the very next day at his elementary school, an, uh, an Olympian wrestler showed up. Uh -huh. And he is known throughout his elementary school as the wrestler, yeah. the boy who likes wrestling. And so he got to wrestle with this, this Canadian Olympian, and uh, the Olympian showed him a couple of moves. Oh, wow. And so, you know, uh, and I met him, and he told me, he came home, and he was all excited. He said, Nan, you wouldn't believe what happened. <laughs> and I said, oh, I would. <laughs> and I just said, 
I said, see, I said, all you have to do is, is actualize. And so take that hunch one step further. Usually our conditioning tells us to discount it. It's not reality. But w the only reason it's not reality is because it's never been allowed. And so for all you individuals or communities who really want to manifest, it really does take the power of our words, the openness of our intention, and the receptability of, of not discounting that, that first intuition. Because, you know, I hear so many people say, oh, I should have listened to my intuition. I would have been right. But they discounted it because they were trained by the Western system because it's not rational. But, you know, what, what the greatest understanding is, is that all of these components that were given to each, each color of man in our mythology and our ideology can't work unless we all come together. So we can't properly move unless vision and the heart and the relationship to that movement is all in unison. So these are the things that I think are really important for the 20th and the 21st century as we embark because we really do need to do something for our environment and the future generations that are going to come. Absolutely. There's, there's so many more things we could talk about, but I think we're coming to the end of our time. And I wanted to ask you about a book that uh, you might like to recommend to people out there. Yes, there's this um, scholar who is a um, second-generation theologian, lawyer, and uh, he comes from our First Nations communities. His name is Vine Delora, Jr., um, Today he is in Spirit World. He's been there for two years. But uh, they've just celebrated the 30th anniversary of um, the release of God is Red. And um, the book is uh, an overview of the native view of religion. And um, But what I'm speaking about is, has really not a lot to do with religion. Uh, what I'm talking about is a way of communicating a way of being open to communication that uh, dispels the idea that the rational being is the superior being and the feeling capacity is not of any uh, significance. Um, quite the contrary. When we don't follow, it is our feeling capacity that feels the disappointment because we didn't initially feel and understand with our mind what our heart already knew. Right, wise words. <laughs> Thank you, Millie. I'm, I'm really uh, appreciative of the time and the wisdom that you have imparted to our, our group today, our listeners today. Well, thank you for having me, but I have to own my part. I'm only a speaker. Um, all of this information and knowledge that I carry came through my ancestors, my teachers, my elders, and those animals, those trees, the, the organisms that surround me. So, you know, because I can't detach myself from all the totality that is. And, and I can't because if I don't have that, nothing makes sense. Nothing is in balance. Nothing is in harmony. So thank you for allowing me to come and share. And I hope you've enjoyed what I've said. And uh, I'm open to any kind of follow-up, should anyone be interested. Um, if they wanted to find me, if you wanted to hear more or, or even correspond, my email is Amelia McCumber, A-M-E-L-I-A, M-C-C-O-M-B-E-R at yahoo.ca not yahoo.com yahoo.ca because I'm located in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Millie. That's wonderful. So if you want to, uh, to know more about Millie, I can put that link to her email and to the book on the show notes that will be located at www.com communicationdiva.com and I encourage you to uh, 
to check that out, and I'll have uh, I'll have more information there. And I thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Jen Swanson. Bye bye.